What's up, everybody? Top of the morning, Sunday sessions, episode 38, here to deliver tons of insight about scaling out your e-commerce business. If this is your first time joining, my name is Eric Castellano. Welcome to the Amazon Lit YouTube channel. Smash notifications, make sure you turn them on so you get notified when we go live. Got some updates to talk about. First of all, ASD is right around the corner. Super excited about it. It's absolutely free to attend. You just go to www.asdonline.com. Now, a few updates um, and information and insight about ASD. I get a lot of Instagram messages and YouTube comments about like, hey, is this a good event? I know a lot of Amazon sellers go there. So let me just paint a little bit of a picture for you about the opportunity that exists at ASD Market Week. Okay. So last year we did a little over $3 million in sales revenue from vendors that we met at ASD. So the opportunity is there, but you're going to get out of the show what you put into the show, right? So if you're just going to show up, you're not going to do any research on the ASD website. You're not going to connect with any vendors previously to going to the event. Right? You're going to bullshit and just walk around the trade show with no intention, then you're not going to have an amazing experience to ASD. A lot of ASD, the benefits of going happened before. Right, So I encourage you to go there, especially if you're in the Amazon space. There's a lot of vendors. Like I said, we do about $3 million in annual revenue from vendors we bet at ASD and probably an average profit margin of about 18%. So um, it's great. I love meeting people in person. It's phenomenal. It's my favorite thing to do. That's how you really get to harvest the relationships. So a little backstory. We were doing business with some of these vendors a couple of years ago that um, attend ASD, but until we started going in person and meeting with them physically, the product opportunities and the discounts that we needed to really grow those relationships didn't exist previously. So like that in-person connection is completely next level when you're able to connect with them in person and they're able to put a face to the email, a face to the name, um, and you're able to just have that human connection with them. It really elevates the opportunity for greater discounts, better relationships, more product opportunities, um, secret catalogs, like all those things that everybody's looking for. Because at the end of the day, everybody's looking for discounts and discounts are great. Right. Uh, but if you're not harvesting the relationship, it's going to be very challenging to get them. And it. And everybody's biggest problem early on and even mid to sometimes even large sellers, your biggest struggle is finding profitable suppliers. That's the biggest hurdle you need to jump over. So like go to ASD, solve that problem for yourself. Um, we have some amazing events that happen out there as well. We have a trade show walkthrough. Um, so if you've never been to an event, a trade show, and you're in Eat Sellers Rye, you get access to the trade show walkthrough. I think there's only maybe two or three tickets left. But where we walk the show floor with you, we introduce you to companies that we've been doing business with. We tell you where to go, what to say, how to navigate the show. So super excited about that. Um, and let's get right into it. Oh, also, BGHL has happened on 227. That's the day after ASD starts. It's in the evening. It's in downtown Las Vegas. And essentially, we fly in speakers from all over the world. And it's an opportunity for people in the e-commerce community, a couple hundred of us, to hang out, network, and learn what's working in 2023. So let's get to some questions here. Uh, when product sourcing, do you always match the buy box or do you price at profit? I wouldn't buy the product if I wasn't able to profit at the buy box. Right. As long as the Kiba data shows that that current buy box is consistent. Right. So let's say uh, in order to be profitable, I need to be at seventeen ninety nine. Right. To make two, three bucks on the product. But consistently, the buy box is at 15. It's like, why would I buy that product at all? So, um, no, we do not match the buy box We're we're the goal is to match the buy box, but at a profitable price. Uh, so this person says, I can't open wholesale accounts without a physical store location. Is there a way to overcome without getting a storefront? First of all, the first part is you're not uh, you're not able to earn, open certain accounts without a physical store location because I've never had a physical store location. And I do business with maybe 40 or 50 different distributors, wholesalers, brands and manufacturers across the country. Um, but if a, if a company is requiring you have a storefront and you do not 
one could be a little complicated to open that account. So what I would do is I would ask them what trade shows they're attending, right? And the purpose of this is not only to get a list of a bunch of trade shows that you can go to and meet other vendors at that you can create accounts with that may not require storefronts, but then you can go chat with them in person and explain to them like the value you provide as an Amazon seller. Because most people, they just want to purchase a few units from a company, get the best discount, but they provide provide no value to the to the wholesaler or distributor that they're doing business with. Like, you know, asking these companies, um, what products do you have a lot of that I could help you get rid of? Do you, do you need help moving inventory on certain SKUs, right? So like sacrificing in the beginning for the relationship um, is going to be crucial. But does it mean that if you say, hey, I'm going to spend $50,000 a month with you, I do not have a storefront, I would hope that, you know, the revenue I'm going to be providing your company would be enough to get around that. Um, it doesn't mean that they're going to say yes, you know, so um, unfortunately, if you don't have a storefront and they're requiring you have a physical storefront, there's really no solution to it unless you were to leverage and get a storefront or use a friend storefront. But here's the thing with storefronts. Most of these companies want to know if you have a storefront because they're expecting you to also sell their products in your storefront as well as Amazon. Right. So it's like you got to look at your motives. Right. Because if you're only looking to get a storefront to navigate around their restrictions, and you're telling them you're going to sell it in your storefront where really you're just going to backdoor all the inventory onto Amazon. It's like, is that really even a relationship you want to create? Because the chances of them shutting down your account when they realize you're purchasing such high volume and then they go on Amazon and they realize there's new sellers on all their listings pumping out all the volume that you're buying, they're going to realize very quickly that you're not even selling it in your storefront. It's a great way to get the account closed. So it's like you always got to go into the opportunity with a vendor with the right motives, you know, because you don't want to tell them you're going to list in your storefront and then you backdoor it. That's not how I build relationships. It's how some people do, but I'm not looking to make a quick 10K. I'm, I'm looking to make a couple hundred K with a vendor. What else? I bought products in new condition in a master case from a liquidation company. I have an invoice. Can I list as new or will I get an IP complaint? So if they're brand new inventory and you purchased them from a liquidation company, you can list them as new. But here's the thing. Um, if there's any account health issues or any violations that pop up, if the company you purchased them from has liquidation or closeout in the name, their invoices will not work to remove the account health issue. So whenever we purchase from liquidation and closeout companies, it's a risk versus reward scenario. And the same thing can happen if you list a use, right? Because sometimes they require invoicing. So um, the only time we purchase from liquidation and closeout is when we weigh the pros and the cons of purchasing the inventory, knowing that we cannot use their invoices for ungating approvals or any account health issues. Amazon does not accept invoices that say liquidation and closeout um, for any account health issues. So you got to be mindful. So normally, so a few times a year, we purchase full truckloads from liquidation and closeout companies. Um, with the understanding that if anything was to happen, we would not be able to use that that data to fix it. Um, a and S Supply, hello. Would you consider selling a product if your net profit is two to two fifty? Yeah, absolutely. Depending on how much the product costs. You know, if it's a hundred dollar product, I'm not interested in making two to two fifty, right? But if it's a seven dollar product that I'm selling on Amazon for twenty bucks, and that two to two fifty. You know, as a 10 to 12 percent net margin, then absolutely I'll jump all over that. And a big indication of when you should make decisions to take lower margins on your product is based on the volume that they're moving. Right. So if a listing has the potential to sell five, six, seven hundred units a month because the listing moves five, six, seven thousand units and you'd be one of eight or nine sellers, then absolutely I'm comfortable picking up that product and making two to two dollars to two fifty on it. Because it's like you figure six hundred orders at two dollars profit, that's twelve hundred dollars a month in profit. You get 10 products like that talking $12,000 a month in profit, right? And that's not even including all the other products that only move maybe 12, 24, 36, 48, 72 units a month. So like when you put all that together and you have your slower moving, higher profiting items and your faster moving, lower profiting items, it just opens up a whole world of opportunity for a very healthy spread of SKUs within your Amazon business.
Um, so Ermin over here on the tube asked, what's our minimum ROI when deciding to buy from a supplier? So we don't really have a minimum ROI. We focus on minimum gross profit margins. Uh, it's right around 8 to 12 percent, depending on the volume. Um, but our average ROI as a company is about 30, 35 percent. So you can use that metric and, and just look between, you know, anything less than 30 percent may not be worth your time. Um, and that's just based on averages from our business for from products we sell. And and the 35% ROI that we operate is very healthy. Um, but we only know it's 35% because after the fact of purchasing the items, we do not purchase items solely based on ROI. We used to, and it really skewed our numbers because ROI, let's just say, you know, 30% um, on a $10 product, that's $330. That's great, right? That's a nice chunk of change to be making on a $10 product, $330, especially if it's moving a few hundred units a month. But a 30% ROI on a product that costs you a dollar is 33 cents, you know, or 30 cents. So if you're going to use ROI, you can't just have an ROI minimum requirement. You also have to have a profit dollar amount minimum requirement. So let's say your ROI minimum is 30%, and then you also have a requirement of minimum profit of let's say 250, right? So this way, any products that you're making 30% on, but aren't also bringing in at minimum 250 in profit, you know to pass on those. How do you properly delegate a buyer from your Amazon business? So hiring a buyer is one of the most complicated things to do in any Amazon business. And the reason why is because if you go into Indeed or Monster.com or LinkedIn, like you're not going to find people who used to buy on Amazon that you could then hire in your business. Now, if you're using virtual assistants, absolutely, you could go to overseas, you know, um, in Bali or Indonesia, and you could find people who've worked um, for other Amazon companies and have some experience. But um, from my personal experience, I always find that having a stateside buyer is much better and much more efficient, even though you have to pay up to have the stateside buyer. And the reason why I prefer to have a stateside buyer instead of an overseas buyer is because, let me ask all of you this question, right? Like what's the number one selling product in India? Or what's the, the number one trending product in Indonesia right now? You have no idea because you don't live there, you don't understand the culture, you're not a part of the community, so you have no idea, right? So it's very complicated to train someone from overseas on how to understand those subtle nuances that would make them a more efficient buyer. Um, so when we're training our buyers, a very intensive process in the beginning. The first thing that we do before we even hire them full time is we give them access to certain modules in eSellers or I, right? And for the first week, we pay them $100 a day, so $500 for the first week. They are not hirers employees yet. This is basically a test for them. We put them through our eSellers or I training. They watch certain modules. They report back to us on the Friday after those five days of watching that content and taking notes and exploring it. And we sit down and we have a conversation with them. Because lo and behold, come to find out about 50% of the people we put into eSellers or I that we're about to hire um, as buyers, 50% of them after they watch all the videos and they're like, wow, this is a lot of this is a lot of work. This is like a completely new business. I'm very confused here. Come to find out 50% of the people that we put through that, they end up not wanting the position because it's something they're no longer interested. So instantly you wean out 50% of your applicants or potential hiring applicants um, because they're no longer interested in the position. So the ones that we do hire, um, it's a very intensive 30 to 90 day training period. We're in the first 30 to 45 days. I'm literally reviewing every single order they put together. I'm bringing them in their office. I'm popping up people on the big screen. We're looking at each ASIN individually. Um, I'm providing them insights of what I would do based on the quantities they wanted to purchase. So let's say they were going to buy 60, but I think we could get 75 or 72, right? An extra case. I would be like, this is why I believe this ASIN could sell an extra case in a month. Because looking at the Keepa data, you know, looking at the buy box statistics, this seller only has 10 units left and the next competitive seller is listed at $2 higher. So like I'm analyzing these numbers, trying to input everything that's in here into their brain. Right. And I also sit them down with other people in our business. So they're not only getting my perspective on buying, but they're getting 
the other employee's perspective on buying. Hiring a buyer is a very challenging process. It's very labor intensive. You got to review their orders consistently um, to make sure they're making educated buying decisions because buying is the foundation of your company. If you're not buying the right products, it doesn't matter how fast you can produce them, package them, label them, ship them. If they're getting to Amazon and they're not making you money, then it doesn't matter what you're doing. You have to make sure you have an elite buying team. I can accredit a large portion of our success to our elite buying team. You know, we have uh, we have a, a team of five buyers, and they're very efficient. They purchase about they purchase about four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars in cost of goods a month each buyer. Um, you know, and I work with some some companies who have 50, 60 VAs in a different country, and their buyers, all fifty of them, are buying the same amount of inventory that one of my buyers. So it's like your buyers are only as efficient as you train them. You got to train them thoroughly and review their orders and also set minimum um, dollar amount requirements for purchases. So in our company, it's $10,000. If a buyer is going to purchase any product that they're going to spend more than $10,000 on for one product, regardless of how many ASINs they're selling it across, they need approval from either myself, Sebastian, or our, or our buyer manager. Right. They need a separate set of eyes on that. For you, if you're getting started, that might that minimum requirement for one investment in one product might be a thousand bucks for you. You know? So you have to put in those guidelines and that infrastructure so they're not going spending your money and losing your money. Right. And you also have to put ownership onto them. You know, we make sure that our buyers are also not just buying the inventory, but they're managing the pricing. If they spent $50,000 on a purchase order, they can't just set it and forget it and send it into Amazon, never look at it again. It's their responsibility to dive into those metrics and make sure that the inventory is selling. And if it's not selling, I expect them to come to our Thursday meeting and deliver a solution of what we're going to do to get that inventory moving. That solution might be pulling it back, sending it under different, different ASIN, might be running a small PPC campaign, might be running a, a discount or a volume discount, right? The, the first discount could be through a coupon. The volume discount could be like if a customer purchases two, they save 5%. If they purchase three, they save 10%, right? So tearing out the structure and making sure that they're solving problems for the inventory they buy is imperative. It's imperative. Which strategy would be better, going off distributors first or first finding brands on Amazon, studying them, whether they have a potential or not, and then approaching that specific brand? So definitely opening distributor and wholesale accounts is going to be a thousand times easier than going brand direct, especially if you're brand new storefront. Most brand direct relationships, they want to see a storefront that has some established seller feedback, that has other products that they're selling in their inventory. Sometimes they even want to see products that are similar. So let's say you're about to close a, a grocery brand. They want to see that you're selling other grocery products. So closing brand direct is definitely much more challenging than closing wholesalers and distributors. Your main focus early on should be wholesalers and distributors because a lot of them will open accounts with anybody. You know, it's it's when you start reaching out to brands that you see restrictions like, hey, you need a storefront. Um, and it's complicated in the beginning because you don't have an extra $3,000 a month to spend on a storefront. You know, you might have, you have a warehouse at that time. So it's like definitely brands are harder to close than distributors and wholesalers. And ASD is really no brands. It's all distributors and wholesalers. Well, mainly wholesalers. I don't think there's any distributors there. Um, it's mainly wholesalers. And there's also some good close on liquidation companies. If you operate a business where you maybe sell on eBay or, you know, Poshmark and you're looking for like bulk pallet deals at the low, it's a great trade show to attend as well. Um, how do you accurately gauge sales before placing an order? Uh, so Keepa, Keepa is huge as well as AZ Insight. Um, so we'll use AZ Insight to get an estimate of the volume that the listing's moving. And then we'll analyze the Keepa data as well as if it's a variation, we'll analyze the variation data to make sure like if the listing says it's moving 300 units a month, I want to look at how much inventory is on the listing, what the competitive seller's prices are, and if I can compete for the buy box, you know, so and I'm also looking at that Keepa chart, the peaks and valleys. I'm looking at the changes in BSR. I'm looking at the 
the average consistent buy box price to make sure that I'm profitable. Because some of these keeper charts are crazy. It's like the price of Bitcoin, you know. So it could be sixty thousand dollars a couple months ago, and now all of a sudden today it's at twenty three, and 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 a month ago it was at sixteen. Amazon is very similar. There's very large price fluctuations. So um, gauging velocity is imperative. I agree. I think any any BSR under three hundred thousand three hundred thousand is pretty reasonable, except for when you get into some of the smaller categories like baby automotive, like an automotive products ranked at three thousand three hundred thousand is not selling anything at all, right? That's the equivalent of like a, a grocery product in in, in five six hundred thousand. It's not moving any inventory. Um, and same with baby. Baby is a, a smaller category as well, so the the BSR needs to be lower. Uh, but yeah, we purchase products for 300,000, especially in those heavy mover categories like grocery, personal care, um, home, um, health and household, home and kitchen. Those are some high volume categories. So there's opportunity there. Do you reply back to suppliers that have products with demand, but there's no margin for us? It depends how little the margin is. You know, if the margin is you're losing $5, then the chance of getting a discount slim to none, right? But if you're missing the margin by a few percentage points, let's say you pull up their catalog, you realize you're making five or 6% margin on all their products. Absolutely, I would reach out to them and try to get some discounts on those products, even if it's my first order, because the way I see it is if you don't ask for the discount, then you'll never know if you can purchase their products. And the, the answer is still no if you don't ask. But if you ask, the answer could potentially be yes, right? And sometimes what we'll do is we'll put together two orders. The first order will be a much smaller one, let's say $1,500, $2,000 based on the current pricing in their catalog. The second order would be a much larger one, let's say ten dollars or $12,000, which is the same products, but I'll have slight discounts requested for all of them. I'll send that over in the same email with a little explanation saying, hey, Here's two orders. The first order is what I can place at your current pricing in your catalog. It'll be about 2000 bucks. The second order is the order I can place if you provide me discounts on this product, this product, this product, this product. It's a, it's a $12,000 order. So from a business perspective, when I pop open that email, I'm like, wow, this guy, he's going to spend $10,000 more with us if we give him a 5% discount on this product, a 7% discount on this product, a 3% discount on this product. It's like, absolutely, I'll entertain that. Most business owners will. Um, any idea how very big Amazon sellers stay in business year after year, selling a majority of uh, SKUs at a loss? Uh, my first question to you, cars and cleaning, would be how do you know they're selling at a loss? We have no idea what price they're paying for their products. So out of $63 million in sales revenue last year in 2022, we had a negative profit of about $135,000, which is nothing, nothing, right? So those, that negative profit is skews that we lost money on, right? So out of all the whatever 50,000 different types of products we sold last year, the, the, the ones that provided us negative profits was only about $135,000, which in the grand scheme of $63 million in sales revenue is not a lot. So you, you don't know what they're what they're paying it for. They could have got a huge volume discount. They could have got it on a closeout. They could have a great relationship with the manufacturer or brand, or they could just be clearing out inventory and they are losing money on that listing. So we got a question over here. Does production cost include salaries? It does. And we divide that number by the amount of units you sell per month or send into Amazon warehouses for FBA. It's the latter, cars and cleanings. So in order to get your production cost per ASIN, which will illuminate a lot of information of what your minimum buying requirement should be, you take all your expenses, rent, labor, shipping, poly bags, labels, everything. You take that monthly number and you divide it by the amount of orders that were shipped to FBA, not the amount of orders you sold, the amount of orders you produced in that 30-day 30 time, 30 time period. That will give you your PCPA, which is your production cost per ASIN. The reason why this number is so important is because let's say your production cost per ASIN is $1.50 and your minimum buying requirement is $2.00. You know that the net profit you're making per sale is 50 cents. It's not really great unless you're doing huge volume, right? But if your production cost is $1.50, then you could make your minimum uh, buying requirements, let's say 275. 
And now you know that the minimum net profit you're making, if all works out, is $1.25 per raising. You know, when you scale that out and you're talking, you do 10,000 orders a month, you're talking $12,500 in net profits monthly. You bump that up to 50,000, you know, you're talking what? What is that? 50,000, $62,500 a month in monthly, profit, in monthly profit, right? So it's just a matter of scaling it out at that point. Um, if I get an IP complaint with no invoice to help account health, does this mean my account is banned and I lose all my inventory? No, not necessarily. Um, you are a new seller. This is my biggest fear. So I think it's super important for newer sellers to make sure um, that they have the proper documentation to submit for any account health issues, because you're absolutely right. In the beginning, a few account, account health things could definitely be detrimental to a newer account. But I say that to say this, there is literally, I don't want to say no problem that can't be resolved or no account that can't get unsuspended. Um, we've had some issues with getting um, some section three drop shipping accounts unsuspended recently. But other than that, you know, we've been able to get hundreds of accounts back for some of the craziest reasons, review manipulation, uh, missing invoices, um, huge order cancellations, Amazon holding your fees. So it shouldn't really be a fear. If you're doing your analysis and you're researching these products and making sure that you have the proper invoicing, you're set up. Um, what trade shows do I recommend new sellers attending? Definitely ASD. ASD is the most new seller friendly market um, that exists, 100%. Another good trade show is the um, Sweets and Snacks Expo out in Chicago. Um, Expo West is good as well. It's a little more brand direct. What I would encourage you to do, American Bargain Store, is Google the local convention center near the closest city that you live by and just look for trade shows. You know, there could be different trade shows. You got to think out of the box, right? If there's a fishing trade show, go to it, right? Who knows? You might find a great distributor who sells lures or fishing reels, you know, something you never even thought of, right? Or maybe there's a video game trade show in your area, right? Or a kitchen trade show. Like there's all these different types of trade shows that I think most people don't even really think about. So I would pop into your local convention center website and just search what trade shows are popping up and you can even do it in a you know if you're welcome if you're open to driving a couple hours you can even expand your search and look for nearby cities as well how many items do you recommend for a test order our normal test orders usually no less than 12 to 24 but sometimes we go more aggressive based on the volume that the listings moving but i think a sweet spot's about 24 asins um, what are we spending per month? Cost of goods. So about 42%. We did 5 million, a little over $2 million. Lily girl, she's a new seller. She's got three reviews. I bought 250 stock and now a big seller has come in with more than 2000 reviews with 270 ratings. Now I'm not getting the buy box, even if I lower the price. So first thing you want to check is how much inventory do they have? Right. Because if they only have 100 units and the listing selling a thousand units a month, then really they only have a couple of days worth of inventory and they'll sell out and you'll be able to get the buy box again. Right. But if the listing selling a thousand a month and they have five thousand units, then you'd have to essentially wait four to five months for them to sell out their inventory and start sharing the buy box. So that's step number one. You got to look at how much inventory they have. Right. Because that's going to determine how competitive of a seller they are. And then based on the inventory that they have, you make a decision of how you're going to win the buy box. I'm not sure if you put if you're profitable. Um, OK, so you're saying you're not winning the buy box, even if you lower the price. So what we like to do when we're having trouble winning a buy box on certain listings, or we're trying to move a little bit more inventory. We'll set up what we call a catch all campaign, right, where we add a few ASINs to a PPC campaign. You have about a $10 daily budget, so about $300 a month, right? And you don't have to run it for the whole 30 days. And I have a very low cost per click between, you know, five and 15 cents, right? And we'll throw that ASIN in that campaign with the hopes that Amazon will start prioritizing the buy box to us. Another great thing we like to do, and it's absolutely free to set up. The only thing they charge you is the discount that you offer. Um, is a volume discount. So if you go into Seller Central and you go to the advertising tab and you click at the bottom, I think it's promotions. 
Um, I might be mistaken there, but it's the last option on the advertising tab. You can set up volume discounts, which essentially will let the customer know that Lily Girl, you're offering a 7% discount if the customer buys two, you know, or you're offering a 10% discount if the customer buys three. So that may prompt Amazon to give you the buy box. And then the last suggestion is if you're if the if the seller has ridiculous amounts of inventory, uh, you ran the numbers, there's no chance of you getting the buy box. What we'll do is we'll just liquidate that product, right? Because there's no sense of leaving it in Amazon and having sitting and collecting dust. Because let's say the cost of goods you could get back is $500. How many times can you flip that $500 over the course of six months? You could probably flip it four to five times over the course of six months. So you could turn that five hundred dollars that's just collecting dust in Amazon right now waiting to get the buy box, you could turn that into 2500 over the course of those six months. So it's like also understanding, um, and, and my buddy Oliver Flips, he just posted a cool post about this. He's like, you know, you got to know when to get out of a listing. You got to know. It's super important. Also, too, if you're new and a lot of this is a lot of this sounds confusing or you're hearing me talk about words that you don't really understand yet. We have a completely free beginner's guide to Amazon wholesale success that lives in our YouTube channel. It's a it's a 22 video playlist. Uh, we'll kind of break down the fundamentals and teach you everything you really need to know to get started. It'll teach you a lot about the lingo and and you know um, what to look out for when you're researching products and how to ship your first inventory into Amazon and all of that. Um, and also. If you're a more advanced seller and you're looking to really level up, then we have programs for you as well, whether it's eSellers or I or Inner Circle. All right, my friends, I got to break out of here. It's been a pleasure. If you got any questions about ASD or anything, just send me a message on Instagram. I'm more than happy to help. Addy, connect with me, please, um, so we can get you set up on that call. If you're still in here, and if not, I'll send you a follow-up after this. But I appreciate all your time. I'm looking forward to hanging out with a lot of y'all in Las Vegas. It's going to be an amazing week. You know, there's going to be hundreds of us out there. It's a great opportunity to network, um, get in-person, real-life experience at a trade show, especially if you're new. It's the best trade show to go in the United States if you're new because it's very Amazon seller-friendly. A lot of trade shows... 95% of them, no, 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 no. They don't even want to talk to you if you sell on Amazon, which there's ways around that. ASD is great. So we'll see you there. Have a beautiful day. Stay grateful. Stay lit, my friends.